girl that went to our school, when the seas are rough, the fishermen can't fish. And this day the seas were rough and she said, Daddy, you're not going fishing today. And he said, I'm waiting, I'm waiting until the seas calm. And they know if they don't catch fish, they don't eat. The only lunch they have is in our schools. And she said, Daddy, in our school, we learn about the big God in heaven. And the big God in heaven hears us. Not those idols, Daddy, that we have on our shelf. They don't hear us. The big God in heaven hears us. She dropped on her knees and she said, God, help my daddy to catch fish today. Her daddy went out to fish. He was the only fisherman that caught fish that day. His boat was loaded so much so he shared it with the other fishermen. When they got into the shore that evening, they asked him, how did you catch fish? He said, I don't know. But my little girl goes to that mission school. And she told me this morning there's a big God in heaven. And she talked to the big God in heaven. And the big God in heaven helped me to catch fish. Well, you've been listening to a lady by the name of Hulda Buntain. Chances are very good. You may not know who she is. You may not have heard of her name, but she is the wife of the late Mark Buntain. The two of them started a missionary outreach in Calcutta, India, a number of years ago. And if you take the time to listen to the remainder of her speaking at a church a few years ago, you'll get a small taste of how God has used two people who are willing to give up their lives to reach lost souls. This uh, video is not so much about them as it is designed. My purpose in it is to encourage you born again saints of the Most High God, to keep being faithful to what God has called you to do. Keep being faithful in doing what you believe God wants you to do. If I've observed one thing in Christianity now, growing on nearly 40 years of being a born-again believer myself, Christians have a hard time getting a grip on eternal rewards in heaven. So many younger carnal Christians want rewards now. They want to see results now. I can so identify uh, in doing the Precious Testimonies ministry and various other aspects of ministry. I have been guilty as much as anybody else. I want to see results now, God. And when I don't get results now, or within a reasonable amount of my time, then I start listening to the devil's lies, and he'll be, well, see, God didn't call you to that. Well, you called yourself. Well, you need to go in a different direction. Well, 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 well. He'll have you out in a boat, <coughs> tossing and turning on a stormy sea. I have come to a solid conclusion that if our motive as born-again believers is to be used of God, first and foremost, primarily, to help reach lost souls be saved, we are doing the most important work of ministry we could do on this planet. Out of that, all other aspects of ministry are secondary. Now, I know many would disagree with what I just share, just said, and I respect their right. It's just that I believe God has clearly revealed that our number one priority always should be, how can God use me to help reach lost souls? 
I've spoken a great deal about this. I don't know that many people have listened or care to listen, to be honest, uh, in other writings and video broadcasts, but I've had one dream, one very supernatural dream some years ago. And that dream had to do with eternal rewards, joy, joy for the believer in eternity. And it was connected with soul winning. I can't encourage you enough, my friend, to don't quit, don't get distracted, don't give up on your soul winning efforts. Always be teachable from the Holy Spirit, always be willing to modify, always be willing to make any necessary changes, but don't quit laying up for yourself treasures in heaven. Hulda Buntain wrote a book a number of years ago. It was called Treasures in Heaven. You can still find that on Amazon. Uh, I haven't done a re recent search on it, but I think it's still available. Treasures in Heaven by Hulda Buntain. God called her husband, Mark, to leave a comfortable ministry here in the United States doing evangelistic work and go to Calcutta, India. And he wanted her with him over there. Well, she did not want to go. And she so struggled with giving up her grandchildren, her, her siblings and the grandchildren that she wanted to uh, be around and, and see them grow up on their own and with f local friends in this country. And eventually she went biting her lower lip, so to speak, blood dripping off of it. And everything in her did not want to be in India. She wanted to stay here in America. But God got her over there. She writes this book, Treasures in Heaven. She writes a book that God used to minister to me a long time back about the value of a lost soul saved. The value of a lost soul saved. The potential, the unlimited potential of a lost soul saved. There is no end to the potential to a lost soul saved in that what God can do in that lost soul now saved through eternity. It's bottom line in it all, all of it. None of us know how God can use any of us through eternity, bless us through eternity as he wills to do. But first we have to get saved. And out of that becomes the discipleship process. Yes, I understand. And that's a huge job. But a lost soul saved, discipled to understand the wisdom of they too coming into the mission field of availing themselves to be used of God to help plant water in reaching lost souls. It's an eternal pursuit. Eternal rewards await those who will apply themselves to helping reach lost souls. Jesus did it. This is a one page eight and a half by 11 flyer. People are ordering that, they're making copies, they're putting that out, bless God, they are wise. They are wise. I'm believing for a huge, huge, miracle. I may not see it in my lifetime. I'm growing on age 73. It doesn't matter. I'm believing this earth will in fact be saturated with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ far more than it ever has before, before Jesus returns. And he's looking for people who will help take the gospel, the good news of the gospel to the four corners of the earth through the internet, Cell phone technology, computer technology, print. We have ways to accomplish the Father's will to the degree he's happy before he lets Jesus come back to earth. 
So my friend, be exhorted, be encouraged to do everything the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do. Don't get tired, don't quit, don't get frustrated, don't get upset. The enemy's going to try to do all of that and more to keep you from being a vessel that God can work through to impact the lives of other people for God's glory and your eternal reward. I'm going to play the remainder of uh, this video and you can hear a whole lot about the ministry as it grew through this sister and her husband in India. Thousands and thousands and thousands of souls have come to Christ Jesus through the effort of two people. Two. And then they are out multiplying, reaching lost souls, helping disciple, take care of people's needs, food, hospitalization. God doesn't even need two people. He needs just one. One who's willing to be stretched and to believe him for miracles. Take the time to listen to this lady share. Uh, I, I think it'll really bless you now. God bless. I don't know how much you know about India, but India now is the largest democracy in the world, two-thirds the size of the United States, already has reached one million, one billion, <laughs> one billion people. Soon will be larger than China. Now, India has improved tremendously in technology. Bangalore is the software capital of the world. But I don't think I need to tell you that, do I? Because any time you have something wrong with your computer, you pick up the phone and you talk to India, right? But you know, the statistics prove that one out of every six born in our world today is an Indian. But India is a very complex country because of the caste system. Now you say, what is a caste? A child's destiny is determined before they're even born. When we went to Calcutta, they told us we could not educate a low caste child in our school. They said a low caste child does not have the mental ability to learn. But aren't you glad this morning that God is no respecter of person? I walk into our hospital and I see doctors and nurses from the slums of Calcutta. Children that we have educated, pastors in our churches, for we are now in 11 states as the Calcutta Ministries grew. There were all these states surrounding us without a gospel message. And the Calcutta Ministries now is responsible for 11 states with 232 million people. And you know, it is just wonderful to see all of our leaders, our pastors, our school teachers, all nationals because of our wonderful Bible schools and training institutes. And it reminds me over and over again, dear ones, God is no respecter of persons. But what to tell you about Calcutta this morning? Nine miles long, four miles wide. The latest statistics I learned when I was in Calcutta a few months ago, 22 million people squeezed in such a small area. World organizations have called Calcutta hopeless city. They say the only hope for Calcutta is burn it down, start all over again. But you know, there's one scripture in God's word and I love it. Whenever I'm home from India and I speak in churches, I tell this scripture because it's so important. Proverbs 3:27, withhold not good from them who deserve it. 
when it is in the power of your hand, your hand to do it. You know, a lot of people put missionaries up on a pedestal. They think somehow we're celebrities. I've got news for you tonight or this morning. We're not. You are. Because if churches like yours across this great country, we're not here. And missionary pastors like yours were not there. We wouldn't be in Calcutta today because everything that you have seen on this screen is because of faithful people like you who have given through faith promises month after month after month after month and offerings to build these works. And I am so grateful Whenever I am in churches and I see precious people giving offerings, I say, God, reward and bless them, especially now in this time of recession. Sacrificial giving is what we have today, and we'll always be grateful for our wonderful Assembly of God churches. Well, 1954, a young couple stood on the SS Mauritania ship sailing for Calcutta, India. I tell missionaries today they have it easy. They go by boat, either by plane. We had to go by boat. Took us three ships in two months to get to Calcutta. We were invited to go for one year of evangelistic ministry. The year previous, Mark had returned from the Orient. Our missions department had asked him to go for six months to hold evangelistic youth crusades in the countries of the Orient. His last crusade was in Japan when he held a youth, big youth conference with thousands of young people. And when he was leaving in the Tokyo airport, our senior missionary said to him, Mark, come back and give us two years to build up the youth ministries in the land of Japan. Now, I was born in Japan. My parents were missionaries in Japan. And your wife was born here, so please come. And Mark was just about to say, maybe we will, when God spoke to him and said, this is the last time you'll speak to Oriental people, you'll go to India. He didn't tell me when he came home. India was far remote from our minds. But 15 months later, we received the invitation to go to India to hold crusades in that land for one year. The Sunday before we boarded the ship, Mark spoke in glad tidings in downtown New York. I love to go to New York. Whenever I'm in that area, I go and I stand and I think, this is where it all began. Because Sister Marie Brown, the missionary, I mean the pastor's wife, was asked to close in prayer. And she asked me to come forward and stand beside Mark she put her hand on both our shoulders, and she prayed a very strange prayer. She said, God, make this couple a blessing to India for years to come. Going home, I said to Mark, I thought maybe he knew something I didn't know. <laughs> what, did he, what did she mean years to come? <laughs> We're only going for one year, aren't we? You know, in your 20s, you think differently. And I was thinking years to come in the land of India. Let's think twice about that one. But you know, God had plans for our lives that we didn't know. We started in a tent, bare piece of ground, night after night. Souls started to be saved in the tents. We started with a small audience and then it grew every night and every night. And then the monsoon rains came. It was too wet to hold meetings in a tent. We were able to get an upstairs hall in the main street of Calcutta. And there was a nightclub underneath, and they laughed at us. They said, hell downstairs, heaven upstairs. And then it was time to build a church. No church had been built in Calcutta in 100 years. And there was no property available. 
And the only property available was the, the land that we had held the, the tent services on, owned by a Muslim family, and, and they weren't going to sell to a Christian organization. But aren't you glad this morning that prayer changes things? One day that old Muslim man said to Mark, I don't know why I'm doing this, preacher, but I'm going to sell you the land. Christmas Sunday, 1959, the first church was built in Calcutta in a hundred years. What a day of rejoicing that was, and it was the Assembly of God Church. But you know, in 2009, I was back in Calcutta, stood behind that pulpit of that first church, looked out on the audience. Whoa. We thank God for the past. We thank God for the present. But you know, we know there were greater and future things in store for us in Calcutta, which we are experiencing today. But you know, everything got too small. School got too small. Church got too small. Time to build again. We searched Calcutta for property. There was nothing available. You can imagine how congested all cement. There is no land available in that congested city. But you know, if you knew Mark, if God told him something, nothing changed his mind. He came home so excited one day. He said, I found the land to build our new church. I found the land to build the hospital. I found the land to build our big school. And I looked at him and I said, where? He said, on the main street of Calcutta? I said, it can't be possible. We've searched the main streets of Calcutta. No, he said, it's four blocks square. I said, that's a huge piece of land. He said, I said, where in the world is it? And you know what he told me? He said, it's an old cemetery. I said, a what? No. This burial board will never give you a cemetery. He said, no, they won't, but God will. And do you know what? That cemetery is not dead anymore. You saw the hospital on the screen. On. Calcutta is so many hours ahead of us. You know, every state in India has a different language. And they come to Calcutta for work. That's why it's so congested. And we took a survey of the eight most important languages that have come to Calcutta. And in eight different languages today, in Calcutta, so many hours ahead, eight different languages, eight different times during the day they have their services. Over 5,000 people worshiped and praised God in that church today. And that's what I tell you this morning, dear ones. Nothing is impossible with God. And do you know, impossible is one of God's favorite words. If you don't believe it, write it down. Write it down. Impossible is one of God's favorite words. But you know, as we started to work in Calcutta, James chapter 2 became alive to us. How can you tell anyone God loves them when they have nothing to eat, no clothes to wear, no comforts of this life? Can you tell a man lying on the streets of Calcutta, God loves you? He'll turn around and tell you, nobody loves us, or we wouldn't be in this condition. A beggar walked into our tent meeting. He wouldn't even sit down. I'll never forget that night. In the middle of Mark's message, he screamed out these words. Preacher, feed our bellies and then try to tell us there's a God in heaven that loves us. A little girl fainted in one of our first classrooms. Mark said to her, darling, when did you eat last? She said, I can't remember. Rushed her to a city hospital, low caste. Why should they care? Two in the bed, two under the bed. He came home that day with tears in his eyes. He said, I will not only 
educate these boys and girls, but I'm going to feed them and medically treat them. As I told you, we started our first school with 200 boys and girls. Today we have 100 schools with over 30,000 children. You saw those little children on the screen worshiping and praising God. In our schools, I call our children our little evangelists. In our village schools, we're not allowed sometimes to have a church. We have a chapel, and we call it the Mercy Chapel in the Mercy School. And we have the chapel every morning in our schools, and on Sunday, that chapel is used for a church. And we use the children. They sing. And parents are parents to save all over the world. They come to see their children. And God is working in hundreds and hundreds of villages through the children, educating the children. They go home and win the parents for Christ. You know, we're in Orissa. That is the state that was persecuted so badly a few years ago filled with fishermen and their families along the beaches of Orissa. It's the large ocean of the Indian Ocean. I tell you, it's the most poverty-stricken area that we work with. They live in shacks, shacks on the sand. One little girl that went to our school, when the seas are rough, the fishermen can't fish. And this day, the seas were rough, and she said, Daddy, you're not going fishing today. And he said, I'm waiting, I'm waiting until the seas calm. And they know if they don't catch fish, they don't eat. The only lunch they have is in our schools. And she said, Daddy, in our school, we learn about the big God in heaven. And the big God in heaven hears us. Not those idols, Daddy, that we have on our shelf. They don't hear us. The big God in heaven hears us. She dropped on her knees, and she said, God, help my Daddy to catch fish today. Her Daddy went out to fish. He was the only fisherman that caught fish that day. His boat was loaded, so much so he shared it with the other fishermen. When they got into the shore that evening, they asked him, how did you catch fish? He said, I don't know, but my little girl goes to that mission school, and she told me this morning there's a big God in heaven, and she talked to the big God in heaven, and the big God in heaven helped me to catch fish. In our church that night, it was packed with fishermen. And today, we have a thousand members in that fisherman's church, all because of a little girl that went to a mission school. That's what I mean, dear ones, reaching children for Jesus Christ, feeding, hunger. 25,000. We are feeding in our street and school feeding programs a day. Precious children, only food they get in the whole day. Danielle Valamont is with me. It's so wonderful to have her. Her father's the president of our Calcutta Mercy Ministries, doing a great job. And on the book table at the back, there's two books, Woman of Courage and Pathway to the Impossible. If you read those books and you want a miracle, it'll give you plenty of faith to believe that impossible is one of God's favorite words. But for $10, you feed a child for 10 days. And you know, when I walk in our feeding lines or when I go to our schools and see those precious children eating, I say, God, which family? are praying for this child today. Because, you know, everything we do, whether we feed the children, whether we medically treat, or whether we educate, it's for one purpose. 
We're not just a humanitarian mission. We're a compassionate ministry. Because when Jesus saw the multitudes, what? He was moved with compassion. And everything we do. And so when you buy a book or when you read the book, pray for that family that you are feeding. Because through this feeding program, it's the marvelous way of reaching families for Christ. And then our hospital. I tell you, dear ones, it's the greatest arm of evangelism that we have. Treating 40,000 a year, free patients. Yes, it costs money. Sometimes we have to have lots of faith that God will help us. But the sick, the suffering come to us every day. Twelve chaplains in our hospital every day going from bed to bed to bed to bed. And our chaplains always tell us, we are the best pastors that you've got. I said, why do you say that? They said, we have an audience, a different audience every day, every week, every month. And it's so true, leading those precious people to Jesus Christ. Leukemia is one of our worst killers amongst children. You saw on the board, on the, on the film today, that blood going into the children. 500 children every month are receiving blood transfusions. When I walk into the ward and I see the blood going into those precious children, I say, Jesus, when you walked this earth, you met a lady that had a blood problem. She couldn't even get near you, but she touched the hem of your garment. You felt it go out, she felt it go in. And she was healed by the power of God. Oh, put power in that blood. And you know, it's, a mar it's just marvelous how many children are healed in our hospital. And then cleft palate conditions. Oh, dear ones, I've never seen faces like that. One out of every 700 children born in India today has a face like you saw on the screen and worse. I walked in one day, I said to our doctor, he had 30 children in the ward for operations the next day. I said, doctor, can you do anything with these faces? And then I saw a mother sitting near one of our beds. And she had her head covered. Well, I knew she was not a, a Muslim lady. Only Muslims cover their heads. I knew she was a Hindu lady. And you know, if you have a deformed child in India in a village, you're shunned. They feel in their reincarnation and in their Hindu religion that that family is being cursed because of reincarnation. And so that poor family are shunned, and that mother can't even go to the well in the morning with the rest of the ladies for water because they're cursed. And I pulled a chair up beside this mother, and I said, why do you have your head covered? And all she did was look at me with tears running down her cheeks, and she just pointed like that. I looked down into the bed. Oh, I've never, ever seen a face like that. So deformed. And I knew her story. I said, Mother, tomorrow it'll all change. That little girl will be wheeled into our operating theater. The next morning, I waited. I told them, let me know when that operation is over. And I stood with that mother to see that little girl being wheeled out of that room. What a transformation. Now, our hospital has started rural clinics. We call them Mercy clinics in the villages. Because our hospital is government recognized, we have mercy clinics in the villages. 
And you know, in places where you can't build a church, a Muslim village, radical Hindu village, they'd burn it down. But they won't burn down a rural clinic. They won't burn down a mercy clinic that's treating their sick. And do you know that soon that mercy clinic, the doctor's table becomes the pastor's pulpit. And on Sunday, we have church. Now they won't run you out because Monday morning you're treating their sick again. And from that village, this mother was sent by our pastor to the hospital. Now, what do you think when she takes that little girl back to that village where she has been shunned, where the family has been cursed, and that curse is lifted? And the pastor moves in and says, that's what Jesus can do. What an inroad it is to the village. Our hospital and the rural clinics coming to our hospital and beautiful children being operated on. That's what Jesus can do. And that's what medical ministries is all about. You saw the blind children. Nobody wants a blind child. That's the worst curse of a village. I was in the hospital one day when five of our children were operated on. We examine all the children to see if operations will help them. I said to the doctor, will they see? She said, some partially and some totally. When the bandages were taken off those eyes, I was so excited. Those children had never seen light. And for the first time, they looked up at the lights. Now, in Hindi, light is butty. And butty. 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 They loved the song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. And as I hear them sing that song, I think, dear Lord, they say I once was blind, but now I see. They can't see with the physical eyes, but they can see with their spiritual eyes. And the joy on their faces, unwanted children, and now loved and cared for. But these five... That song became a reality to them that day in the hospital. We joined our hands and we sang Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I once was blind, but now I see. 10,000 girls in a suburb 15 minutes from our hospital called Sonagachi sold into prostitution. Can you imagine? Danielle will tell you all about it. She's been there. 10,000 precious girls in an area one mile square. Should those girls be helped? Do you know? We prayed. God help us to get an inroad into that den of prostitution. Nobody was allowed to go in there and preach the gospel. That was forbidden. Oh, yes, you could go and visit them, but that's all. Do you know that one man, one of those men in charge of that brothel came to our hospital and asked our hospital, Christian Mercy Hospital, would you bring your staff and your clinic, and would you start a clinic in the middle of our brothel? Well, <laughs> you can imagine what we said. Of course we will. And today, right in the middle of this prostitution in Sonagachi brothel, which is the largest in all of this area. We have a clinic from our hospital with a Christian doctor and access for our nurses to go in and speak to these precious girls and tell them somebody loves them. They'll turn around and say, nobody loves us. We wouldn't be here. 
One little girl said to my daughter, Bonnie, she said, I was 12 when I was sold into prostitution. She said, one day I played with dolls and I was a little girl and the next day I'm a woman raped five times. Do you know, God has given us a miracle in Calcutta, that congested city. We found a piece of land and that land has been purchased and we are going to build a laundry which is now under construction to take those girls out of prostitution and give them a job in the laundry. They can't come out unless they make money. And this laundry will supply facilities for the hospitals of Calcutta. And those girls will work in that laundry. And next door to that laundry, we are going to build a hope house for the children. They can't go to regular schools. Those children have seen too much. Too much. And we are going to rehabilitate those precious girls and put them in the Hope House. And Pastor, I shared with him last night and I shared with him this morning that we are raising money right now to build that Hope House. The laundry is being constructed, but we need the Hope House for the children, precious boys and girls. When I see those children, my heart breaks. They don't deserve to live in that place of horror. Some of those little children, they're babies. And while the mothers are doing this vocation, as they call it, they have to chain the baby's leg to the, to the bed so the child won't crawl away. Can you imagine? Your children are so well cared for, and those precious children. God help us. We will do it. You know, Mother Teresa was a lovely little lady. She brought all her patients to our hospital. She encouraged us so much to build the hospital. Our doctors treated her till she died. One day we were in the hospital together before she took very ill. And we were talking about the poor of Calcutta. And you know, she's only four feet tall. And her little finger would always go like this. And she said to me, you know, always remember, it's not how much you can give, but it's the love you put in the giving that counts. And I thought to myself, it's not how much we do, but how much love we put in that doing that counts. I said, Mother, do you mean if we don't put Jesus' love in our giving, all our work is in vain? She said, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. And then she took my hand in her 87-year-old hand. And she said, when you give to the poor, you do it unto Christ. Dear ones, next Sunday is your faith promise. You're going to use your hand to fill out that faith promise. You might say, well, what does my little mount do? I can't give a whole... Oh. Your little amount does a lot because it goes with other amounts and other amounts and other amounts to make up that faith promise that this church is supporting your missionaries. And that's why I tell you this morning that it is so important. It is so important. Faith promises keeps us on the mission field. It keeps us building churches. It keeps us building clinics. It keeps us. Whatever has been done is because of your faithful giving. For doing does not count unless love motivates it. And loving does not count unless doing demonstrates it. You can't love Jesus without doing something about it. I told you that we were in 11 states. Seven of those states are in Northeast India. They look more Oriental than they do Indian. Mark was invited 
to speak at a conference for 15,000 people. They had not heard about the Holy Spirit. One of the pastors, just one, came up to him and said, Brother Bentain, please preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit tomorrow night. But he said, this is an interdenominational conference. They may throw me out. But he prayed about it. And the next night, he preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He had nine interpreters for that conference. And at the end of when he preached, he said, God, help these people to understand what I spoke. And he reached out his hand and he started to pray. And immediately he started to speak in other tongues. He didn't know, but he was speaking in their language. Telling them the reality of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that night hundreds received the Holy Spirit. And it was the birth of our Assemblies of God churches in all those seven states. Until today we have over 350 churches schools, Bible schools, and our works are growing. I was invited to go up there to hold a pastor's conference. Our general superintendent, a wonderful young man, graduate from our Bible school in Calcutta, he said, Auntie, I'm going to take you somewhere tomorrow you've never been before. I said, where is that? He said, above our capital city in Kohima, the largest cemetery in the eastern world. When the Japanese were coming over from Burma in that world war, he said the largest battle was fought here. I couldn't believe it. Canadian graves, British graves, American graves, young people that gave their lives for our freedom. But as I walked into the cemetery, there was a large arch. And I read those words. Go home and tell them, we gave our today for their tomorrow. I stood under that arch, and I said, God, we have given our today for hundreds of tomorrows. And then I thought of a grave in Calcutta. Mark died so suddenly. I stood beside that grave in Calcutta, and the culture is that you stand until the grave is full, shovel by shovel. 20,000 people attended that funeral. Crowds, crowds, crowds. And I said, God, 35 years now we have been here. Surely that should be enough. After all, we only came for one year. Have you ever argued with God? I did. But you know, I'll always be thankful that our worship team started to sing that song, Love So Amazing, So Divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. I said, God, if you help me, I'll stay. And I'm so grateful that the work has grown tremendously now, 57 years. We are nationalized now. I have lived to see the day when all of our work is under national leadership. Children from the slums of Calcutta now leaders all of our doctors, all of our nurses, all of our pastors in the 11 states, all of our leaders, all of our teachers in our schools, all Indian nationals trained from the slums of Calcutta. And dear ones, let me tell you again, that's what your money has done. Helped us to train these nationals. But can I ask you, what are you doing with your today? We live in a materialistic world. Investments are here today and are gone tomorrow. 
I've watched the television and see beautiful homes flattened overnight, fires destroyed, hundreds of homes, material things can go very fast, scams, people losing money. But do you know something? When you invest in the kingdom of God, it pays the best dividends. Because money is the currency of men, but faith is the currency of God. And you can't give out, and you can't outgive God. You will never be able to save the world, but you can save somebody's world by giving a child a family a tomorrow. Many times I'm on television, and they ask me, what, would, what is your greatest accomplishment in 57 years? And I unhesitantly can say investment in lives. Lives change to make life changers. I sat on the platform a few months ago in Calcutta, watched a young man, our associate pastor of our great local church, our main church, 5,000 in that church. He walked to the pulpit, preached a wonderful sermon. I couldn't help but reminisce that Sunday morning. Twelve years old, he and his brother, ten years old, and two sisters lost their father and mother. They were orphans, had nobody. We stood at the grave with that child, with those children. And I remember Patrick turning to me and saying, Auntie, I've got nobody now, nobody. Putting my arms around those children and saying, yes, you have. Raised in our children's home. And today, today, associate pastor of our great church, I was in San Diego just a few weeks ago. I was at the book table. A young man came through the door, walked over to me and threw his arms around me. And I looked up, I recognized him. I said, what are you doing here? He said, Auntie, I've driven all the way from Los Angeles to see you. Do you remember me? I said, oh, yes, I do. A single mother, ready to commit suicide, came to us with this boy, little boy, only about six years of age, in rags. Didn't have enough food to feed that child. He had no shoes on his feet. We moved in, and that mother became a marvelous Christian, sang in our choir and was in our women's ministries. We put this little boy in school. Brilliant, brilliant. Went to high school, went to our junior college, got a scholarship to the United States. And I looked in the eyes and he said, Auntie, it's payback time. I said, what are you doing? He said, I am the vice president of Mattel Corporation. Every time you buy a Barbie doll for your children or grandchildren, remember, a little poor boy from Calcutta is the vice president of that large organization. I was in Issaquah, Washington a few weeks ago. Chinese boy, same condition, poor, rags. Mother said, can you help my little boy? Ian Chang, he said, Auntie, every time you fly a Boeing jet, remember, that this little boy that you educated 
headed the group that put the electrical system in the Boeing aircraft. I said, Ian, tell me about it. And he said, God's been good. My whole family came to know Jesus, and you helped us. Payback time. Dear ones, today I tell you, this is why I say investment in lives. Buildings crumble, but when you invest in lives, they make life changers. I walked into Hallmark store to buy a birthday card, and I looked up on the wall, and I saw a sign, and I said, oh, Mr. Hallmark, or wherever you are, <laughs> you sell cards with that slogan, I'm going to steal it for missions. And I leave that with you. It said, if you love enough, you give your best. If you love enough, you give your best. You know, I love the scripture, the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Because the Revised Version says, those that are inconspicuous here shall be heroes there. That's what you are. Oh, you may not be on television. Your names may not be in magazines, but I want you to know that scripture is for you. Inconspicuous to the world. Your faith promise, what you write on that faith promise is inconspicuous. Inconspicuous here, but heroes there. For much is required from those that have much, for their responsibility is greater. Our responsibility is to reach the world for Jesus Christ. And thank you so much for the opportunity of being here and sharing with you what God has done in Calcutta. God bless you.